I'm Dominic Nichols, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we'll be discussing the most recent events in Ukraine and around the world with senior foreign correspondent Roland Oliphant, who's live in Ukraine. And I'm delighted to be joined today by former Ukrainian MP Aliona Livko and our special correspondent, Mick Brown, who's written this weekend about Russian oligarchs and the effect of sanctions on their lavish London lifestyles. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Putin's war in Ukraine has destabilized energy markets the world over. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. I started with a roundup of some of the news around Ukraine. So the big news today, the terrible news today is the helicopter crash in the suburb of Brovery, which is about 20 k to the east of the centre of Kyiv. The latest reporting is 15 people, including three children killed in that, including Ukraine's interior minister, died in a helicopter crash. Um, it was originally reported as 18. That's now been downgraded, but 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 still very, um, very sketchy, the details. And we'll hear more from Roland shortly. And, uh, but that's what the officials are saying. Now, a helicopter was flying supposedly towards frontline regions, came down, uh, landed on a kindergarten and then bounced into the, the courtyard of a, of a set of apartment blocks, big nine story apartment blocks. Uh, nine killed. None of those killed were on board the emergency services helicopter. So not a military helicopter, but um, emergency services helicopter. A further 29 injured, including 15 children. The cause not yet established. The aircraft was a, a French super puma operated by all of Ukraine's law enforcement agencies. And you can find images on social media of the site. There's, you can see the rotor head and parts of the blades and the engine compartment that have been um, smashed up against, um, against the building with other debris from the aircraft and the buildings around in the grounds of the, of the kindergarten. The very shocking, shocking images. So as I said, those, include, those killed included Dennis uh, Monastersky, who's the interior minister, as well as his deputy, Mr. Monastersky, who was 40, 42 years old, was responsible for all police and security inside Ukraine and is the most senior official to die, Ukrainian official to die since the war began. President Zelensky has said, uh, he's quoted, it said, today a terrible tragedy occurred in Brovery, Kyiv region, an SES, that state emergency services helicopter crashed and a fire broke out at the crash site. The pain is unspeakable, end of quote. Now, Air Force spokesperson Yuri Inat said that it would take several weeks to investigate the disaster. Uh, and he said, unfortunately, the sky does not forgive mistakes, but it's really too early to talk about the causes. I'll just make the point, before we speak to Roland, I'll just make the point that helicopters are extremely vulnerable to ground fire um, on the battlefield as they're much slower than jet fighters. Now, there's no suggestion that this was brought down by, by enemy action here. We just don't know yet. But I just want to just make the point, helicopters have very little armour because if you cover it in too much armour, they just simply won't get off the ground. Um, and when it comes to flying, most military helicopters do prefer to fly low to hide behind the folds in the ground or trees in, in rural areas and buildings in, in cities and town. It's called terrain masking, and literally hiding behind terrain. Uh, it is effective, but it leaves very, very little time for the crew to react to any mechanical problems with the aircraft, uh, any ground fire that does hit the target, uh, or environmental hazards such as power lines. So power lines are virtually invisible um, to the pilot. I used to fly helicopters. I can tell you that obviously you can see the big the big stanchions, the big pylons, but the wires in between, exceptionally difficult. And on a day with, with marginal weather, that such as it, that, uh, it is today, in Kiev, it's it's very very difficult to see those wires. Now, no suggestion that that's what what happened. We simply don't know. But I just want to put a little bit of context there. But Roland, uh, I, I see you're in the in the space. Please uh, give us an update, please, from the ground. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you've covered it. Um, it, it. Things things did change, didn't they? We originally were we were 18. We were told 18 dead, and now it's down to I think you said 15. I'm seeing 16 at the moment. But that that's more or less. 15, 16, we think, are the total fatalities. As you said, nine people on board the helicopter. That was all the passengers and crew um, died. And the remainder, including three children, were people um, on the ground. Um, so I've just, I've just got back from bravery, actually, um, to have a look. It is, as you can imagine, um, you know, kind of surrounded with police ticker tape and, um, and, and lots, of, uh, lots of cops and interior ministry troops, um, uh, National Guard troops kind of, you know, keeping a cordon 
you know, keep keeping the crowd at a distance, including the press, while um, while the investigators get on with it. But I mean, what what's obvious is. I'd be interested in your take as a, as a former helicopter pilot, Don, because it seems to me it must have been in a spot of bother before it hit the ground. Um, quite serious bother. And the reason for that is, um, so Brovery is a, it's a kind of residential suburb. You, you, you could call it a kind of Ukrainian Croyd. And so it's, it's, a, it's, it's technically a satellite town, but it's kind of being absorbed into, um, you know, Kiev's Eastern expansion. Um, and it's kind of made up of, these very large nine-story apartment blocks which are arranged into these kind of big rectangular courtyards um now the 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 nursery school that was hit is a two-story building built in the middle of one of these courtyards and this courtyard is you know it's full of trees there are as you said wires kind of going there is no way a helicopter um you know would want to to get down into that courtyard in fact to get down into it it must have come over uh, one of these nine-story um buildings and then kind of descended and also the other thing that's interesting speaking to witnesses um and also it's just visible from the uh from from the damage it looks like what happened is the helicopter hit the um the courtyard kind of faces northwest um to southeast um and it looks like it kind of hit the the facade of the nursery school on its north western side and kind of skipped like a stone hitting water and then and kind of leaves a trail of fire along the top of the nursery school and then just plots down um, uh, on the tarmac on the other side, right outside this, um, right outside the stairwell of one of the apartment blocks um, and explodes. Um, everybody there, all the residents, all the neighbors talked about a very, very powerful explosion. Um, people were a bit confused because people aren't that surprised to hear explosions in Kiev these days but you expect to hear an air raid siren on air raid alert before it happens um people were talking about you know my windows look the other way i'm on the other side of the block um and we saw this big red flash um so powerful that we thought the explosion was over there but actually it was behind us which gives you an idea of the power of it, it also set off a secondary explosion of a car um i was told um and there is also um there are some reports unconfirmed that that some witnesses saw it on fire as it came down. Um, and if it, and, and it's quite clear that it, I, mean, I think it might've been leaking fuel. That it's quite clear. There was a lot of, um, a lot of fire spread around that courtyard this morning. Yeah. Certainly the images I've seen with, with burning debris in, in a long trail suggest that stuff was coming off the aircraft, which might indicate, as you say, that, that there was, the fuel was on fire. It might've been leaking fuel, um, after aviation turbine, fuel is is extremely flammable um i mean just, i'll go to Eleonora in a sec for for a comment but just just in terms of what might be might have been happening in the cockpit and the reason that we don't don't really know is that uh, a pilot is always told that when there's a when there's an emergency in the cockpit the priority is aviate navigate communicate so first thing aviate you 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 just fly the problem okay whatever whatever's happening immediately you you solve that you solve that problem even if the result is that you ditch in water or you land on top of a building or you land in trees you just if you have to you just get it down you don't try and do anything clever so aviate is the first thing the second thing is navigate when you then try and pick somewhere uh, conducive to land and you try and avoid uh, a built-up area and you try and make it as as survivable as possible um, but like I say that is a secondary consideration and the third one is communicate so you do not hit the radio and start saying mayday, mayday, mayday or anything like that and you don't try to talk to people and tell them what's going on. You know, you are all consumed with solving that that immediate problem. Coming down in the middle of a of a built-up area, of course, there's all sorts of hazards, not least of which is the people on the ground and the children in this in this situation here. So not surprising at all that there's been no suggestion at the, yet that the pilots were able to make any kind of radio message and therefore give an indication as to what happened because that talking to the outside world is the is the the least important thing that a pilot has to deal with um, at that time. But Alioni, if I could, if I could turn to you um, as a as a former as a Ukrainian a former member of the uh, Ukrainian political. Uh, framework i'm you know i'm sorry for your for your loss today uh, i don't i believe you don't know mr monsterski personally but but what's your reaction to the news today thank you dom um indeed it was um it was a shocking news this morning and despite the fact that ukraine is going through quite horrific um tragic events 
on daily basis. It was somewhat shocking to hear that such a high-level official uh, was killed in Ukraine. It was somewhat difficult to believe because he is obviously a core of that security in the country. Um, so it was. Um, it of course raised many questions straight away. Uh, whether it was just an unfortunate incident or what has actually happened, is there any uh, sign of uh, Russians getting involved or any sort of diversion? That's of course uh, still being investigated, and we don't want to make any empty speculations on that front because it's also interesting that SBU, so Ukrainian Secret Security. Um, service is the one who's investigating the case. Um, it's not just the Minister of in Interior Affairs, it's also his first deputy minister, so the person who would replace him in, in case anything would have happened. It's several aides and pilots who died in this horrific incident. Um, and you're right, I didn't know him personally, but I knew of him. Um, I heard many good things about him from colleagues and former colleagues, uh, current MPs in the parliament. Uh, before um, getting elected by the parliament as a minister and getting appointed by the president, um, he was the chair of the same committee in the parliament of internal affairs and internal security in the country. Um, and his predecessor, actually, the, the former Minister of Interior Affairs, um, Arsen Avakov, was quite a figure, and he was very difficult to replace. I think he's lasted throughout two uh, presidents, two different presidents, and there was a real issue in Zelensky administration of who's going to replace him, because it was time to replace him. He was there from the beginning of the war, and he really helped the situation in the country under control when, you know, there there were many incidents of weapons in the country and um, separatists fleeing into the country, the Russian agents and, and whatnot. So he really kept the security under control. And uh, when the question has kind of arisen who's going to replace him, Monastirsky, as, as a former a lawyer and a person who was involved in judicial reform in Ukraine. So he was also quite active after the revolution of dignity in the country. Uh, he was part of the um, anti-corruption council of Ukraine. So he put a lot of effort into that as well. Um, besides being a, um, a very experienced politician too. Um, he was elected and I think he's done a brilliant job um, at his time in the ministry. Um, and of course, it's interesting to see who could take up on that role now, apart from some temporary um, assignments um, from amongst the ministry. It's, it's interesting to see how that's going to affect um, the situation in the country. Thank you. Um, we will be updating this throughout the day. Our live reporting is up on our uh, online on our website at the moment. We will, of course, put this together, give the most up to date uh, news uh, for tomorrow's paper, but uh, more online through the afternoon. But Roland, anything more to add before we uh, before I move on? Any other? Uh, you've just you've just arrived in the country for this current uh, this current stint out there. But any any other observations, or um, are we going to hear from you again in the next few days? Um, I, I hope you will. You know, I'll, I'll be here for a while. Um, I I put down my initial thoughts in yesterday's newsletter for those who subscribe to our um, our dispatches newsletter. Um, I'm kind of here. You know, I, I'm part of quite a big movement of journalists, to be honest, kind of getting stories ready for the anniversary next month um, on the 24th. So it's a lot of kind of it's kind of an opportunity to reflect, to think about what happened over the past year and, and what this year is going to bring. Um, we, we will be around Kiev talking to people. I started off this trip on Odessa. We will be going, um, you know, further east towards the front. I'm hopefully going to be revisiting some of the, um, some of the people who I've, who I've met and interviewed during the course, um, of the war since the invasion, um, including from the very beginning. So, um, very much looking forward to that. Um, yeah. And, and just on today, I suppose as so often, um, in this war, I just, I think it's worth paying tribute to the to the very ordinary local people who were there when this helicopter came down, um, you know, I talked to you know a bunch of teenagers who had just found themselves kind of, you know, hauling six-year-old kids over the railings and, and and trying their best to do first aid. They don't know how to do first aid, um, but but as so often, you know, it's kind of characteristic of this war: civilians responding, um, you know, just as a group to a tragedy that just falls on their lap. Um, uh, once again almost um but yeah that that is um that's me um do feel free to um to, to to have me on or uh ask me any questions that you want while i'm here lovely thanks roland i'm going to move on because there's a lot to to get through um so next piece of news the um the casualty toll from from saturday's 
Missile strike in Dnipro has now got up to 45 reported now killed. This was a Russian missile strike on an apartment block in Dnipro at the weekend. Pope Francis has spoken today. He said it's heartbreaking. He's appealed for peace at his uh, weekly general audience in the Vatican. He said, quote, Last Saturday, another missile attack caused many civilian victims, among them children. I share in the heartbreaking pain of the family members. The images and the accounts of this tragic episode are a strong appeal to all people of conscience. One cannot remain indifferent, unquote. I think the last line there was was the most telling. One cannot remain indifferent from the Pope. Now, the Ukrainian presidential advisor, Alexei Arestovich, he um, he's a, he's offered his resignation because he initially suggested that this missile had been shot down uh, by uh, Ukraine's forces. Uh, this was jumped on by the Kremlin, and they said, well, there you go, it wasn't us, it was it was Ukraine. Mr. Restovich quickly apologised, said he made a fundamental error, and has, uh, that's his line, his, his words, fundamental error, and has offered to resign. The, uh, his remark caused widespread anger in the country, and like I say, it was used, was picked up immediately by by, uh, by the Kremlin and used uh, to blame Ukraine. Uh, President Zelensky not yet commented on the decision to resign, but Alione, we think you think he's going to go. Um, I think he's definitely going to go. Um, I think he's going. The, I, I'm pretty sure his resignation was accepted by um, the head of President's administration, Andriy Yermak. Uh, to whom he has been an advisor for the last uh, year or so, or just over a year. Um, and it's interesting to see that um, the precedent that he's setting here, where his line uh, was used by Russian propaganda, so he deemed it most um, plausible outcome to resign and not to let anyone use any words um, against the country. Um, so just to give um, a little bit of background to your listeners, um, Alexei Aristovich is somewhat of a phenomenon, a cultural phenomenon in, in Ukrainian war reality, because ever since the war started, um, he was doing um, these daily vlogs on YouTube uh, with Mark Fagan. And I'm sure that many of your um, Russian speaking listeners were also tuning into that daily update. It's it's an hour long vlog on YouTube, where they discuss the developments of the day, any diplomatic developments, military, so somewhat close to the Telegraph podcast, but for Russian speaking community. And he would always provide an update from the front line, any information he could share from the president's administration, as well as just uh, the reason why he became the cultural phenomenon is because he had such a calming and soothing voice and he presented the matters in such a kind of stabilizing manner that at the beginning of the war, I mean, I remember myself uh, when we were all going through a, a brief nervous breakdown for at least the first three months of the war. I mean, I remember myself waking up every moment and crying. I needed at least like 40 minutes of solid cry just to get myself together and go out to face the world. Um, and so he provided that kind of communal therapy uh, for the nation and especially um, the Ukrainian women who um, it's kind of be became um, a joke on social media that everyone wanted to marry Aristovich all of a sudden. Then it was the greatest disappointment for everyone to find out that he's already married and has a family. Um, but uh, jokes aside, he was um, he was a useful stabilizing voice. Um, they grew a massive audience amongst the Russian speaking population of the world. So anyone who was abroad um, diasporas or post-Soviet space. Um, so he would definitely relay that opinion. And I think yesterday um, at their um, airtime, he did mention that he's going to keep on doing that despite his resignation from the president's um, office. He will still do his daily uh, blogs, but he will have probably less responsibility and a bit more freedom. So that's going to go on. And um, I think uh, that he is also might be eyeing um, on his future political involvement in Ukraine once the war is over. He did say that until the war is ongoing, he's not going to speak out against anyone or say anything harmful to Ukraine. And he's just going to um, remove himself from public uh, policy environment. Uh, but three, two or three weeks ago, he did mention in another interview uh, done personally for him that he does not exclude his running for the presidency in Ukraine when the elections are due. Now, if we could just linger on this point just for a moment and talk about, uh, just very briefly, on, on Ukrainian domestic politics. So this this mistake he's made is not enough to, to count him out of future political ambition by the sound of it. And after the initial few months of the, of the war, poli politics is, I wouldn't say returning to normal, but, but there's healthy criticism creeping back into 
domestic Ukrainian politics. Is that fair? Indeed. Um, there is a healthy competition as well um, and criticism of current administration, uh, even though it was almost taboo um, to say anything about Zelensky or his administration that's been done wrong, at least in the very first six months of war, certainly under um, the uh, siege of Kiev, when Kiev was trying to be occupied and when most of the atrocities were happening around the capital, the politicians were obviously out of the capital. Many of them, uh, from personal stories of friends and former colleagues in my hometown in the west of Ukraine, many of them were based there. Um, the whole ministries were allocated in state administrations in Chernivtsi, in Lviv, Ivano-Frankivsk, um, as well as many um, diplomatic missions. Uh, so once they've all returned to Kiev and they've kind of realized that um, there is no imminent threat, immediate threat to um, their position in power, um, Kiev has kind of um, went back to, to politics of it all. Um, there are now more criticism of um, Zelensky and anything that he could possibly even think of doing what people would deem wrong. Um, it's being voiced straight away. Any approaches, any appointments um, that people don't really like. There are many uh, volunteering organizations that feel free to speak out, uh, which I have a feeling might later be transformed into political parties to run for the next um, parliamentary elections. There are many talks of now military um, combats, commanders of battalions, um, even chief of defense staff himself, Valery Zaluzhny, perhaps considering political career in the future. Um, so various talks like that, I, I'm definitely certain it's a bit premature uh, because we're still at war and we're still at risk of not having a country, parliament or president at the end of the day. That is not to be discounted. But I think it's, it's probably a healthy sign of a democracy that, uh, you know, Ukrainian elections are due to happen in 2024. Um, I doubt that they will because I don't think the martial law will be lifted by then. Uh, I don't think the war is going to end that um promptly, sadly. Um, but um, the, everyone is definitely getting prepared. And it is a sign of one fact that Ukraine is a democracy. Lovely. Thank you. I'm going to move on now. I've got other, three other updates we, we will talk about later. Tanks, uh, Germany Chancellor, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has um, not poured cold water, but but not been effusive in his uh, in his comments about supplying leopards. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Austria, the Austrian foreign minister, Alexander Schallenberg, has um, has made some, uh, well, I, th I think fairly daft comments, uh, not so much along the lines of the kind of Putin can't be seen to lose face, but of that ilk. We'll speak about those in a moment. And also Putin today is off in, he's in Leningrad, the 80th anniversary of the of the end of the siege in Leningrad. And is that going to be the moment when he makes, they like, they like he likes these big, uh, these big dates? Um, is this going to be a moment when he makes some big statement about the war, about escalating the war, mobilisation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we'll talk about those um, shortly. But I just want to turn to to Mick Brown now, one of our senior writers here at the Telegraph, um, because Mick, you've written a fascinating piece last Saturday's Telegraph magazine. So um, you can probably still find it in the in a chip shop near you. Um, a fascinating mag uh, magazine article about the lifestyles of Russian oligarchs here in London, but but oligarchs more broadly, and the effect of sanctions on them. So. What did your investigation find? Who's being sanctioned? Are they the right people? And, and maybe if you could start off with, what is the purpose of the sanctions on these on these people? Hello, Mick. Hello. <laughs> well, put simply, the purpose of sanctions is, is to, to limit the reach and effectiveness of, of businesses and industries that support the Russian war effort uh, and to put pressure on oligarchs. And in turn, uh, in hope uh, that the oligarchs will put pressure on Putin. Um, since the introduction of sanctions uh, in the wake of Russia's invasion, there's been more than 1,200 individuals uh, sanctioned and 120 businesses. And these are deemed to have aided Russia's war effort. Um, what happens under sanctions is the assets of any individual uh, on the UK sanctions list, and this means their properties, their bank accounts, their businesses are frozen. So they can't visit the UK. Their yachts are banned from UK ports. Uh, their private jets are forbidden to land. And so the idea of this is, is to basically to hit them where it hurts most, which is their wallets. Uh, how effective that's been, it's kind of difficult to say, really. 
Um, I, I think for the, in terms of the larger objectives of, of hampering Putin's war effort, of damaging the Russian economy, that's a big imponderable. Um, but it's fair to say that as far as the oligarchs themselves are concerned, uh, I think they've been inconvenienced rather than mortally wounded. And by inconvenienced, I mean that the oligarchs who were living here were living pretty high on the hog. Uh, you know, Britain has been very, very kind to oligarchs, regrettably so, in, in, in my view. Uh, when they first started arriving in, in, in the late 90s, they were availed of enormous privileges by lawyers, estate agents, PR men, you know, the whole apparatus existed to make their lives, as, to make them feel as welcome and to make their lives as comfortable as possible. Uh, and that architecture has now collapsed. So they can't go and dine at Scott's. Uh, they can't sit in their expensive properties. They can't sail their yachts to St. Bart's. Uh, um, so tough, you might say. <laughs> so what, you might say. But I think in, in a sense, uh, when I say inconvenience, I think if you're an oligarch, if you're Osmanov or Guriev or Deripaska, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a considerable inconvenience that you now have to sit in Dubai or Turkey, uh, particularly an inconvenience for your mistress or your wife who would rather be in Monaco or Cap Ferret than Dubai or Turkey. So I think in that sense, they've been inconvenienced. Uh, and certainly it's had an impact in terms of, of, of their life, their lives and their lifestyles in Britain, which have basically been cut off at the, at, at the knees. You know, and, I mean, it, it's not that they can't live here. And in fact, one or two have continued to live here. Uh, but life has certainly been made pretty much impossible for them. Um, so you might say, well, how, how, how inconvenient is that? I think in terms of the, the larger picture, uh, is this hampering Putin's war effort? Probably not. But it certainly made their lives very uncomfortable. And that in turn, their disgruntlement and their unease and, and the way it's hitting their wallets perhaps impacts on their relationship to Putin and on their view of the war. Thanks. And the, and the people you spoke to for your, uh, for your article, I mean, how did they... Did, did, did they feel that the, the sanctions regime was applied? I mean, they might not use the term fairly, but did they know that it was going to come down the tracks? Well, the people you spoke to, um, were they in any way, were they suggesting that it was it was randomly applied? Did it seem as if the, the state, to, to you, because like I say, they might not have interpreted it as such, but did, did it seem, seem as if the right people were being sanctioned? And as you say, if all this is is an annoyance, well, fine, I'll take that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's more than more than a mere annoyance. I mean, I, I, I don't wish to minimise the the effects. Um, I think there's divided opinions about this. I mean, we spoke to to, to one uh, Russian tycoon, someone who describes himself as a tycoon, not an oligarch, but who is an intimate of oligarchs, if right. <laughs> if you might say that. Uh, and his view was, and a friend of oligarchs, and his view was that that some of his friends would have been wrongly sanctioned. Um, because of their, because they were welcomed into Britain, they would have contributed an enormous amount to the British economy, uh, and because not necessarily uh, it's what they're doing, uh, uh, aiding the Russian war effort and and, and giving succour to, to 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 Putin. Uh, but then again, if you talk to someone like Bill Browder, who who knows a lot about sanctions, uh, of course in, uh, introduced the Majinsky Act, which has been the basis for sanctions, first of all in America and then throughout Europe and here. Uh, he would say that, that it's been very effective and that the right people have been sanctioned. Um, but the, I, th I think the point, to, the point to make here really is, 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 is the dramatic shift in these people's circumstances. Uh, and if you've been sailing a yacht happily around the Caribbean, you know, for the last however many years, 10 years, and suddenly you put up in a port in Hamburg, as happened to Osmanov, uh, to have it serviced, and the next minute it's confiscated... Um, one interesting point actually was that uh, in, in terms of the resources of these people and the, and the extraordinary, one might say, obscene amounts of wealth of these people uh, is, is that um, Osmanov and, and another oligarch's yacht uh, are worth more than the entire budget of Britain's National Crime Agency. And of course, one of the, one, one of the difficulties here is, is in actually identifying oligarchs' assets. You can identify the oligarchs but their assets, their houses and their yachts and their properties and so on and so forth are all hidden behind veils of overseas offshore transactions. So to actually say, well, Osmanov owns this house, uh, Andrei Guriev owns this house, 
is, is, is very difficult because their name isn't on the lease. You know, it's the name of, a, of, of an offshore company in the British Virgin Islands or Cyprus or wherever. So, so to actually impose those sanctions uh, and to identify and then to prosecute those sanctions is, is, is rather difficult. And the, the agency which uh, is, is, is primarily responsible for that is the National Crime Agency, uh, whose responsibility also includes child trafficking, arms smuggling, drug smuggling. I mean, their, their war against oligarchs is a very small part of that. So one might say that their, 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 uh, their, their budget is, is, is considerably uh, quite substantial. I mean, it's, it's north of 700 million. But uh, that, that barely buys you a giga yacht in, in oligarch terms. So it's a very complicated, very complicated picture. Yes, and I so I understand that the issue comes down to who the beneficial owner is. When the so the the, the tool the National Crime Agency uses, I understand are unexplained wealth orders. So turn around to these people and say, "Well, how, where do you get all your money from, then, mate?" And if you if, if you can't explain it properly, this is not just oligarchs, but this is uh, organised crime in in general. But the beneficial owner then is it a is it a shell company offshore? It's, you know, it's very difficult to to point the finger and say who's who's behind all these things. But I mean, it was it was a shame. Um, that we didn't manage to get anybody from the government or from the uh, from the National Crime Agency to to help with your piece, but just just finally, do you feel like the government would say that this is with what few resources they have, that, that this going in the right direction? They're doing they're doing as best they can with what they've got, or are there are there big gaps in the uh, in the sort of fight from from the government side? Well, I think they're certainly doing the best with what they've got. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't in any way decry the the, the efficiency and efficacy of the, of the National Crime Agency uh, or their commitment. Um, but again, it, it's 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 an interesting point. Why why would they choose not to not to speak to the Telegraph? Uh, you know, I think governments have a tendency towards um, uh, t- towards secrecy rather than towards opaqueness, uh, rather than transparency, I should say, rather than towards uh, 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 a tendency towards opaqueness rather than towards transparency. Um, so I think they're I think they're doing the best they can. But I mean, you mentioned unexplained wealth orders. The difficulty with this is that at the at the outset of this, when all of these properties and these yachts were being seized, there was a lot of talk about well, this is brilliant. We can just confiscate them and then sell them, and the proceeds can go to the Ukrainian war effort or to housing refugees. It's it's not that simple. And under unexplained wealth orders, you need to prove that the origin of that wealth, that the source of that wealth is, is, is from some illegal uh, foundation. Uh, and in order to do that with Russian oligarchs, you'd need the cooperation of the Russian government and tax authorities <laughs> to say, well, you know, this money is clearly comes from criminal basis. I don't think you're going to get that cooperation from the Russian uh, government or tax authorities. Um, so that's a bit of an unexplained or an unsolved and yet to be solved conundrum, really. Uh, and of course, the other question is, what do you do with these properties? Um, you've got some of the, literally in, in the case of uh, Wittenhurst, Andre Guriev's house in, in, in Highgate, you've got the most expensive property in England. Uh, Guriev also owns the top five floors of the highest residential building in India. And these are multi, multi, multi million, uh, million pound properties. Uh, ghost properties is what they've become. And they have to be maintained in some way. Uh, you can't just have a property, suddenly there's an electrical fire or <laughs> water starts leaking through and the whole thing collapses. And they are not the governments. They still belong to Osmanov and Guriev and Deripaska. You know, they are still the legal owners of this. Um, so it's not that easy just to say, uh, all right, we'll flog them off. Um, they do have to be maintained. And in fact, there is some, interestingly, there is a provision uh, within sanctions laws for properties to be maintained. Uh, and, and Petra Avern, uh, one, one of the sanctioned oligarchs, has taken advantage of that and, and, and uh, had what amounts to a million pounds released from his frozen bank accounts uh, to maintain his properties. But also, and some may quibble with this, also to pay his uh, children's school fees. So there's a lot of anomalies in this and a lot of difficulties. It's not as clear cut as anybody imagined it would be at the outset. Lovely. Thanks, Mick. And as I said, your your article, The Mystery of What Happened to the Sanctioned Russian Oligarchs, is online now, last last weekend's magazine, but uh, it's still online now. You'll be able to able to find that. Um, Mick, thank you so much. My really pleasure. appreciate your time. Thank you. Going to move on now 
Uh, back to those other those other other updates I mentioned. So on tanks, tanks been the the flavour of the flavour of the month, flavour of the week. There's this idea that our tanks, the sending of heavy battle, main battle tanks to Ukraine, to um, escalatory, to provocative. If we if we're not yet through that argument, remember the same things were said about high Mars and air defence and and all the other stuff. So tanks. Um, Britain said on uh, announced over the weekend then uh, Ben Wallace put more flesh on the bones um, a couple of days ago about sending a 14 Challenger 2 tanks which are fairly bespoke you know no one else in the world uses them so the logistic tail is quite um, is quite needy but in terms of breaking a taboo was that was that it Britain sending Challenger 2 is that going to be the thing that un- unlocks the, the big elephant in the room if I'm not mixing all my zoo uh, zoo animals here, uh, but the elephant in the room being the Leopards, a German-made Leopard 2, very, very capable tank in uh, in service with, I think, 14 other nations in Europe, but, you know, a, you know quite a number. It's either 14 or 13, forgive me, but thousands of Leopard 2s out there. Poland have already said that they are keen to send their tanks. Finland, Lithuania, likewise, but... Uh, such as the, the way of, of lethal military equipment, it's the manufacturer that has the final say so about export so germany has to give the say so give the green light for other countries um to be able to send their uh, send their leopards so olaf Scholz, the german chancellor said uh, yesterday that that his country would never act alone he quote unquote alone as berlin uh, it, i mean sort of hinted that they're waiting for the united states to send their m1 abrams tanks bef- uh, to ukraine before any decision on leopard i mean interestingly him saying not act alone after Britain said they're going to say well, you know, we're going to send main battle tanks. So clearly showing where Olaf Schultz thinks the the, the, the power base lies and who the uh, you know, who, who's got the, the real influence here. Um, but it, his comments came after Robert Habeck, who's the economy minister and the vice chancellor, said that Germany was likely to approve export declarations for leopards. Um, as I said, there's about 2,000 of these around Europe at the moment. Um, but Mr. Schultz again used this phrase. He said one of the aim, one of his aims, w- was to avoid escalating uh, the conflict, escalating to become a war between Russia and NATO. I mean, this is the narrative that the Kremlin is pushing. So, whilst it might be, uh, yeah, I mean, fine, I don't want it to escalate and become a war between Russia and NATO. Um, but it, I, it's not. That's simply not it. And I, I just don't think it's helpful of Mr. Schultz to use these these phrases because it just it's going to be parroted by by the Kremlin. So Mr. Schultz said, quote, one message above all, we will always act together with our allies and friends. We are never going alone because this is necessary in a very difficult situation like this. I mean, yeah, saying the right things, but they're not they're not sort of <laughs> signing the signing the export license. So presidents of Poland and Lithuania have criticised that position. So Gitanus Noseda, who's the Lithuanian president, he's in Davos at the World Economic Forum this week. And he said, quote, I have to tell you honestly, it's a pity. That's in the, the Germany not giving the export permissions. It's a pity because every day of this war costs a lot. We don't have the luxury for such delays and decision making must be decisive and fast. And then Andrzej Duda, who's the Polish president, um, he said uh, he said that the, the a ruling on these licenses was, quote, very, 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 very needed. I think that, you know, pretty clear where he's going from. And then he added Germany is part of the NATO alliance. And if there's a situation where a few allies are ready to give their tanks to Ukraine, it is an important moment. So all the pressure there, everybody is saying, let's just do it. Germany seemingly reluctant for some reason. Aliona, what on earth is going on here and what are you reading in the politics? Clearly, the situation in Europe remains similarly unresolved and undetermined when it comes to approaching the war in Ukraine. As you rightly say, Scholz is saying kind of all the things that make sense, but that are really unnecessary, especially using the phrase that is so often and kind of carefully used by Kremlin, that narrative of the war between NATO and Ukraine. Um, I mean, it's it's bizarre how vastly used that is by Russian propaganda. And I don't know why would German Chancellor fall into that trap if it was a mistake made by him. Obviously, there was a huge reluctance on German side to get involved in this war in any way. Uh, they were reluctant to give up on Nord Streams at the very beginning. Nord Stream 2 finally stopped and then Nord Stream 1 was stopped by Russians, shall we put it that way. Um, And they eventually caught up to speed with everything that's happening in in Ukraine and in Eastern Europe um, as general. uh, Because you rightly say that, you know, Lithuanian and Polish presidents, they know 
what's happening in Ukraine. They're on, you you could say they're on at the front line of you know European community that's facing the Russian threat, uh, because the only state that separates them from Russia and, and Kremlin aggression is Ukraine. So they know that if Ukraine is not helped, if Ukraine falls, then they will follow Poland and the Baltic states and Romania, all the countries that are on the eastern flank of NATO. They would, of course, much rather help Ukraine with weapons and any reinforcements than actually allow NATO to be involved in this war. I think, if anything, that will prevent uh, from NATO getting directly involved in this war. Um, it is most commendable that uh, Great Britain finally came through, that the UK is finally sending challengers to Ukraine. I think that's a good sign and kind of nudge in the direction of Germany to make that statement and to release the flow of all other tanks. I think you mentioned 14 countries. Um, in total, that's about 1,200 of, of Challenger tanks that are waiting to be sent to Ukraine. Um, the latest what I've read online today. Um, we are, of course, counting on, on these weapons um, because every single day of delay is lives lost. Uh, I think really good news are coming in terms of Patriot batteries. Uh, President Zelensky last night mentioned that Ukraine now is counting on three Patriot uh, battery units uh, to be sent to Ukraine, one from the U.S. as a result of his visit to Washington, D.C. late last year. Uh, the other one was promised by Germany, and we are really hoping that that's going to come through as well. And the third one was promised by the uh, Prime Minister of the Netherlands yesterday uh, during a phone call with President Zelensky. Um, the, the Ukrainian troops, um, about a hundred of them, are already training in Oklahoma, as you've mentioned in your previous podcasts. Um, and I think um, as the training on patriots would normally take up to 10 months, I think the Ukrainian uh, Ministry of Defense yesterday, one of the interviews he gave to Ukrainian media, he mentioned that um, they've come to an agreement with the U.S. allies that the Ukrainian soldiers will be uh, going through accelerated program that will amount to up to 10 weeks to be trained in Patriots. So I think that kind of give us gives us an idea of the timeline of Patriot systems being delivered to Ukraine, along with the tanks, along with other hopefully long range missiles. But I'm sure that all of that is to be determined and at least to be discussed at the Rammstein meeting in Germany um, at the airbase where all the defense secretaries are, are gathering. The NATO kind of defense sector um, is meeting there to ascertain what kind of help Ukraine needs, uh, what is going to get. Uh, I believe there is a meeting in Brussels between those ministries um, taking place today and tomorrow and then going into Germany. So all of that hopefully will amount into the, the help that Ukraine so desperately needs because we can only watch and see that Russia is still mobilizing the troops. They are now going through training as opposed to the uh, conscripts um, that were called into the army in late autumn last year. They were just thrown onto the front line without any kit, any preparation. This time, I think especially under the rule of Gerasimov in, in Russia, they've decided to train the troops to make them slightly more effective. It's not obviously, sadly, the care for lives uh, that are being lost, but they've, they're realizing that their resources, even human resources, are going to be limited very quickly if that approach is to be taken forward. Um, so I think we should be ready for a strong Russian push, especially going into one year anniversary of the war. Um, surely they will try to present some sort of present to Ukraine uh, within the next months, whether it be it from Belarus, where there are currently exercising, exercises taking place um, jointly with Russia, or the east or, or the south in, in Crimea. There's definitely some signs of buildup around Ukraine. So I think they will be preparing for another push. Thanks, Aliona. And just on the subject of um, gifting of armoured vehicles, I should say there's a bit, a bit of breaking news as of, what, 20, 20 minutes ago. So the Canadian Defence Minister who's visiting Kyiv today, Canadian Defence Minister Anita Anand in Kyiv today, has said that uh, Canada is going to be sending 200 Senator armoured personnel carriers. I'm not familiar with the Senator. I'll have a look at that. We'll chat about that um, in the next few days. Um, but I'll have a, have a look at that. So 200 Senator Armoured personnel carriers to Ukraine, that's $90 million, uh, part of $500 million um, that President uh, Trudeau, uh, Prime Minister, sorry, Prime Minister Trudeau announced in November 22. But of that $500 million, 
announced last November, 90 is going to be these uh, these senators, 200 senator vehicles. Um, moving on, Austrian Foreign Minister Alexander Schallenberg, I think, has been unhelpful uh, with his comments that, again, are going to be picked up, I have no doubt. In fact, sorry, they have already been picked up by by Russia. He said that Russia has a role in uh, European security architecture. And he said, quote, we also have to think about the day after, the week after, the months after. He meant about after after the war. He said the European security architecture will have to include Russia in one way or another in the future as a permanent member of the, the UN Security Council and as a nuclear power. Now, unquote, he did say we should unequivocally support Ukraine, but also keep the diplomatic path open with Russia. And that is an increasingly fine line, narrow path, however you want to describe it. But I mean, that's a very, very difficult diplomatic and political space to inhabit there, um, to have unequivocal support for Ukraine and keep the diplomatic path open with Russia. So he has pleaded again at Davos, the World Economic Forum, he's been pleading for for the world to maintain a sense of proportion towards Moscow over uh, the war and said, quote, we must not overshoot the mark, for example, by introducing a visa ban for 144 million Russians. Um, now, that was, to be fair, that was via his uh, spokeswoman um, in uh, while they, uh, she was speaking in Paris. And he said that the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, based in Vienna, should be kept as the negotiating platform um, over the war and criticised Poland's refusal to invite Sergei Lavrov, Russian foreign minister, Russia's foreign minister, to the OSCE meeting recently uh, in Poland. Now, he's in Mr. Schallenberg, that's uh, Austria's foreign minister. He's in Paris for a one day visit, met with his opposite number, uh, Catherine Colonna, France's minister. For Europe and the foreign affairs. Um, well, she's been in post since May last year. She was the ambassador to Britain before that. And uh, the Kronen Zeitung, otherwise known as Krona, Austria's largest newspaper, uh, reported that Schallenberg ha- has told um, Ms. Colonna that, quote, a stable European security arch- architecture that ignores Russia is inconceivable, unquote. How much of this is helpful, unhelpful? How much of it is true? I mean, it, where's Austria on this? Aliona, help me out. Wow, Dom, this is really interesting to um, hear, especially considering that we've kind of moved on from this narrative in Europe, haven't we? I mean, we've heard all the same lines uh, coming from President Macron uh, not so long ago, but he's definitely moved on from that. All the uh, so-called Putin first tayers and apologists and whatnot. And it seemed like they're almost gone into history, but apparently not. Austria is still lagging behind. I mean, one can certainly understand that Austria is one of the successful democracies um, in, albeit Central Europe, but almost maybe considers it to be on on the border of of Europe, the the eastern flank, so to speak. So surely they want to kind of have that provision uh, for cooperating with Russia in the future. And no one says that Russia as a country, as a state, uh, will disappear when this war is over or when Putin is not in power. Uh, But by all means, I think uh, that dialogue with the country or whatever is left of Russia after this war um, and after all this um, finished and and the reparations are paid and, you know, sanctions have their effect. Whatever is left of that country, there will still need to be dialogue that will need to be reestablished with the democratic Russia. And I think that will be the time to kind of implement Russia back into European security, but with certain provisions um, that definitely need to be in place until the, there is a, some sort of generational change in Russia, because even um, the dissidents who fled the country, opposition or intellectuals, philosophers, they're all talking about, you know, when they're being asked a question, what happened to Russia? How did it become so dire? And, and how, <laughs> how did the nation turn so evil all of a sudden or almost... Um, completely oblivious to the crimes and atrocities that they're causing, they're all talking about negative selection in the country. Uh, You know, coming from the great terror of the 20th century under Stalin of the 30s, how they were killing off elites and um, all the writers, poets, philosophers, whatever, and then going into independence of the country uh, where all the politicians that could have replaced uh, Putin, uh, not to go too far, even Boris Nemtsov and, and other people who would be prominent in Russian politics. Um, all of them have now fled the country, obviously. Uh, Navalny is one of the opposition figures is in prison, Vladimir Karamurza as well, and everyone else is just out of the country operating either from Ukraine, for that matter, uh, Georgia or London. And a, a lot of them are in Lithuania, in Germany. 
So yes, there are people to talk to, certainly, uh, amongst Russian elites, but sadly, they're not in the country now. Um, and so right now, that dialogue is absolutely excluded. Uh, when it comes to Austria, um, it's interesting to look at the country itself, especially Vienna, because it is in some way um, like a central European London of sorts, because there's also a lot of Russian money in Vienna. In Austria in general, there's a lot of assets, houses, private um, residential villas of Russian oligarchs, of Ukrainian oligarchs who were pro-Russian as well. I know for a matter of fact that at least two of Ukrainian oligarchs who were pro-Russian who fled the country and completely disappeared from any informational space in Ukraine, um, they had some property in Austria and that's where they could be seen before. Uh, many of the uh, government officials from Yanukovych's government, President Yanukovych, who fled the country and was, was ousted of the country after the Revolution of Dignity. They all had some property in, in Austria, too. And obviously, the home to OSCE, which has not earned much respect um, in Ukraine or generally in Europe because of their various judgments on the war and, and how it's been infiltrated by Russian representatives so much. And, and clearly, the decisions were no longer unbiased. Um, so um, Austria is an interesting country to look at. Certainly, we must listen to the leader of the country as he demands that respect. And Russia will inevitably be always part of kind of European security structure, but only when it returns to being a sane, normal, democratic country. Yeah, I mean, Austria is fascinating. Vienna in particular is home to a number of international institutions. Um, a number of UN bodies are there. The World Bank is there. Uh, I'm told it, it's a it's a bit of a a bit of a kind of Cold War espionage playground. Mm -hmm. Spies running, all, running around all over the place. Um, yeah, we should we should definitely keep keep tabs on that. Now, finally, let's move on to last bit for today. Um, Putin is in Leningrad today. He's commemorating, as I said earlier, the 80th anniversary of breaking the the end of the siege of Leningrad from the Second World War, what Russia calls the Great Patriotic Great Patriotic War. Um, he's going to be laying flowers at the landmark stone monument in um, in the city and at the mass grave, uh, the Motherland statue monument in Piskorovskaya Memorial Cemetery. I've been practicing that. Is that OK? That was great. Oh, thank you. Um, he's going to visit the State Memorial Museum um, of the Defence and Siege of Leningrad, meet veterans from the war and uh, residents who lived in Leningrad during, during, the, during the siege and uh, representatives of civil society associations. Then, I mean, he's at a factory now. I've just seen a quote from him. Um, he's, at, he's speaking at a factory and later on he's going to meet St. Petersburg Governor Alexander Beglov. Now, is this the moment, Aliona? Is he going to make some big announcement? He's going to talk about escalating the war, declaring war, mass mobilization. How much does Putin like taking these moments, these special moments to, to declare stuff? And if so, what do you think he's going to say? I think we've certainly learned that Putin loves his theatrics of war and being as dramatic as possible, uh, because that is part of authoritarian rule, right? You must present some sort of entertainment to the people, scare them into not saying a word, and then make them happy with the little show that you put on so that everyone feels like they're still part of some sort of cause. Um, so going back to your question, whether he's going to announce um, something, who knows? Um, there were talks, obviously, in Ukrainian uh, policy environment that he might announce the second wave of mobilization on the 6th of January, and then it was reported on the 14th of January. Eventually, uh, people started saying that, you know, mobilization never stopped and is just uh, being executed on daily basis. And maybe Putin will exactly go after that, not to cause any more distress, not to make any loud announcements and draw any more attention needed to people needed to um, on the front line with Ukraine um, for this war that nobody really needed. So who knows if he's going to make any statements. He's certainly using this opportunity to kind of galvanize the support for his quote unquote cause the war in Ukraine, uh, because that will add ideological um, that will add ideological um, aspect to it. Um, and um, 
you had the the brilliant Dr. Jay McGlynn recently on on air, who was talking about the you know memory politics, and that's being used in in Russia by Russia uh, very actively. They tried to use it in Ukraine, but by his um, infamous article of you know Ukrainians are not people, and we're all we're all part of the same nation. Um, that's the same narrative. So going back to you know their brilliant days of Second World War and how they resisted the the Western invasion and fighting off the enemy and whatnot. He's certainly going to use that to kind of galvanize support for for the war in Ukraine to keep this narrative going. Um, I believe Lavrov has already mentioned that in this, in modern days, Russians are like Jews being persecuted by, you know, the Western evil people. Um, in the Second World War times, it was the Germans. Now it's... Uh, you know, the Westerners, the NATO states and Ukraine uh, that are being the aggressors um, against Russia. Obviously, that victimhood that keeps people together in Russia. So that's also an important narrative for them to upkeep uh, because, you know, the victimhood always kind of draws into aggression. So that will justify people's uh, feelings of, OK, we need to go into this war. We need to fight and kill Ukrainians. Yeah, didn't he, uh, didn't I see Lavrov use language? He was talking about um, how NATO and the West are trying to solve the Russia problem. I mean, using mm -hmm. very much the language of the Second World War, the Russia problem. And didn't he, didn't he also say, now he didn't say solution, I think he said resolution, but didn't he talk about NATO looking to, to solve uh, to the, the final resolution? And obviously, you know, very heavy connotations of the Holocaust and um, and the final solution language used by by Nazi Germany. So I think he said final resolution, didn't he, Lavrov? I mean, it really, really laying it on, trying to trying to draw a parallel there and saying that you know casting NATO here as the as the sort of not not modern day Nazis. Yeah. So it's it's a clear kind of clear gaslighting by Russia as they normally do. It was the same statement when you know he's compared Russians to Jews who are suffering uh, these persecutions almost. Uh, seeking to be exterminated by the Westerners and certainly like resolution of the Russian issue, which only puts them on kind of a merge of surviving again. And that will they, that must cause their sentiment in a Russian soul to fight back just for their own survival. So it's complete distortion of reality for the Russian people that they still keep using on daily basis. And God, I hope that nation wakes up and kind of turns around and, you know, ask themselves, is this actually the reality? Because it's certainly not. Aliana, thank you so much for joining us today. I am um, sorry, I, I sort of barged into your, your commentary a, a moment ago. Um, but the reason is that, that literally breaking news now, it's just been announced that Igor Klemenko Mm -hmm. um, has been appointed acting interior minister. Mr. Klemenko is the head, uh, well, what, this morning was the head of the national police. He's going to be the acting minister of internal affairs after the death of uh, Denis Monastersky this morning in, in the helicopter crash. So very, very quickly, and I'm sorry to bounce you into this, uh, Aliona, but Igor Klemenko, tell us a little bit about him. What's that going to mean? Um, I believe he was he was quite active in politics as well. Um, he had his mandate in the same kind of security area. So, I'm not sure whether he's going to stay there permanently in that position. Maybe it's a temporary solution that the parliament um, and the, the government just went into to replace Monastirsky. We will see how he gets on. But um, he was also one of the politicians that actively came onto the political scene after the revolution of dignity. So that's very reassuring to see that, you know, we're still on track uh, with any democratic developments. And he knows what's going on in in the industry generally in the in the situation, um, internal situation in Ukraine. So let's see how he gets on. Thank you. I'll just leave the final words, final thoughts uh, with you. Elena, please feel free to give us any any final thoughts. Thank you so much for joining us again. Um, friend to the Telegraph, don't don't be don't be a stranger. Always welcome back your your insights, managing to unlock a lot of the Ukrainian politics and and European politics, quite frankly, is uh, is fascinating and uh, much appreciated. So final thoughts for you. Thank you, Dom. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be on here. Um, highly um, regarded community of experts. And as I keep saying, you give the, the most accurate briefing on Ukraine every day, which I greatly appreciate being a Ukrainian, of course, and having a brother on the front line, just keeping this on the agenda is extremely important. Forcing policymakers here in the West into making relevant decisions, everything from, you know, challengers to leopards. Uh, to patriot systems. Hopefully, uh, my one hope, of course, is that the UK will keep 
going with the help that is providing for Ukraine. It's somewhat sad to see that maybe the UK is not represented in Davos when the Ukraine question is quite high on the agenda. But we've got all of the eastern flank um, members uh, there. We have the greatest support and hopefully the Rammstein uh, meeting in Germany with the new German defense minister will go um, as best as it can for Ukraine. So thank you. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all your Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces if you enjoy this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. And we do read every message. We're especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. Today, Ukraine The Latest was produced by Louisa Wells. <laughs>